education. I did it in Costa Rica. Then I graduated with a master in uh, orofacial and craniomandibular pain disorders in Spain. And finally, I studied orthodontics in Mexico. So that is a little bit about me. That photograph is from... We are going to talk a little bit about how to write a treatment plan. This, I know sometimes something that we don't want to spend too much time on, but I will also incorporate some clinical tips because as clinicians, we all know that that is what we want to hear. So also at the end, you can ask any question that you like. Um, well, if you want, Constantine, you can go to the next slide. So for me, I don't like to stay too much with philosophies. I want to plan all my treatments the same. If I do it with braces or if I do it with the liners, I don't care. I want to uh, find the same objectives. And this is something I really like about the face philosophy uh, because I think this is something you can apply to any technique you're using. So what do we want with our treatments? First of all, we want to be able not just to incorporate the dental aesthetics, but for that to also give me facial aesthetics. We want to just balance the face of that patient. I just don't care. I care about how the lips are looking, about how is that lip strain, how is that muscle function. So I want to have function, and that is something important. So I need to have a stable occlusion. I need to have a periodontal and a stable TMJ. Also, I need my treatment to be stable on the long term, and that is the most important thing. Because for me, I don't care if the patient looks in a class one at the end of the treatment. If I see that patient in one year and it returned to a class two or a class three. So stability is something that is key. And obviously, we want to fulfill the main concern of the patient because that is what will give us referrals. Next slide. So what is important with the liners? With the liners, the most important thing is diagnostics. Why? Because... Uh, aligners are very easy to use if we know what we are doing and if we are planning our cases correctly. Because with the aligners, we have something that is actually telling us the exact movement that we are going to do and to do. For example, what is the problem with braces? With braces, if you want to maybe align the teeth, you can do it, but you cannot control the amount of expansion. You cannot control the amount of proclination. You can yeah, do tie backs. You can place ligatures, but you have in there, and I think nowadays everyone starts with a night tie arch wire is going to expand a lot. The arch shapes now that most people are using are universals. So that is not controlling the movement. With aligners, we are able to control the exact movement that we want, but we need for that movement to actually happen to make a good diagnostic. So for that, we need to have a full photographic records. We need the lateral X-ray, we need the scans. And something that for me now is mandatory in all my patients is a CBCT. Why? Because the CBCT is going to tell me, okay, it's going to tell me where is the position of the condyle. That is very important. And well, I know there are people from Europe in here and also from America. So I know the concept sometimes of rot. And in Europe, I know that they are using also a little bit of Slavicek and Sato. But the main thing in here is that we want for the condyle to be stable. Why? Because, for example, there are a lot of cases that doctors, they go and they never manipulated the patient. So they see a class one kinder relationship, a class one molar relationship. But if you see the, the uh, condyle in the, tomo in the well, CBCT, you're going to see maybe you have the glenoid fossa here, you have the posterior wall, and you have your condyle in here. You don't have a stable position of the condyle, or if you want to call it central relationship, it's okay, it's the same thing. So if you have a class one kinder position, and the condyle is here in the front. As soon as you put the aligners on, you are creating a space in the occlusion. So this is going to give the liberty to the condyle to reposition itself in a good position. It's going to actually be like kind of a deprogramming agent. And what is going to happen? Maybe you need 10 aligners and you tell the patient you're going to be finishing two months, three months. 
But actually, as soon as you put the aligners, the patient deprograms themselves and they go to a class two. And maybe it's one millimeter of a class two, but it can go up to five millimeters of class two. And now your patient is surgical. So it is very important that this is the first thing you need to do on your patients. If you want to mount the case on an articulator, that is fine. But normally, just by manipulating the patient, you are going to be able to know if there is a big displacement. Obviously, this goes a little bit. This is more like a Rothian um, Ockeson uh, like belief. I know as Lavichek, they like to move the mandible forward and they want to reposition. So this also is kind of the philosophy that you want to use, but it's going to be more stable if your condyle is well positioned. Another thing is that maybe if you are treating these displacements, yeah, you're going to need an MRI, but that is more for your clinic because in here, and this is very important, all the treatment plan of the patient, but uh, we can help you as supervisors. All the cases are supervised by an orthodontist, but we are not seeing the patient. So it's not the same seeing the patient than actually just the photographs. Sometimes this is going to change. So it is very good for all of you to do this analysis. Also the CBCT is very important because in many patients we don't have a bone. So there are a lot of doctors that sometimes they are not getting that expansion. They have a, a cross bite, a posterior cross bite, and they want to solve that just dentally. That can be solved dentally, but if you have bone to displace the teeth, sometimes we have the root in here and we have the cortical bone in here. So with the liners, we can do around four millimeter of expansion very nicely. But if you already have your bone here, the cortical bone and your roots in here, okay, you're going to get one of two things you are going to be able to expand that tooth and get fenestration or dehiscencies, or you're not going to be able to move the teeth. Sometimes that happens and you're just going to see how that expansion is not happening. So this is why it's also very important for me and I'm not telling for all of you to do it, but I like to have CBCTs because I want to move my teeth inside the bone envelope. I don't want to move teeth outside the bone. So. These are the diagnostics that we normally use. Next slide. So what do we want to upload to our system? All these photographs. So what is going to uh, give me the profile picture as you can see on the upper left is the position of the lips, the position of the chin, because this is going to tell me, okay, if I need to maybe improve this position, if I need to do extractions or not. I need to have a frontal photograph of the patient with uh, their relaxed position because I want to be able to see if they are closing their lips, if they are relaxed or not. I want to see if there is a uh, lip strain in their uh, muscle hyperactivity. I also want it's also very important for us, for the supervisors, because if we have a deep bite and the doctor is asking to improve the deep bite and we see that here the patient already have a nice smile arch, we don't want to include those operating incisors. We want to correct the deep bite with and, uh, lower anterior intrusion or posterior extrusion of the teeth. So this is something very important for you to make the diagnostics and sometimes for us to corroborate. The radio, uh, lateral x-ray is more for you to do the tracings if you want to and in here is not um, you don't need to send the tracings, but this will give you an idea if the patient has a skeletal problem or a dental problem. The panoramic x-ray and all the lateral, frontal, and overjet and overbite pictures. And this is something that you don't need to be so like, okay, maybe you don't need to go and buy a macro lens. Uh, you can do it, okay, with uh, just regular camera, but try to take this as best as possible because and it's going to uh, show, it's going, you're going to be able to show them what are the improvements because this is something, well, that the patient do not see. They never remember how they were on the beginning. So having really nice detailed records is going to show them that you actually made a lot of things. Next slide. So in here is also something very important to consider in all our patients is the periodontal and dental conditions because sometimes we receive cases just like this one. This is a patient also from my clinic. So in here, you already seen proclination of the teeth. You are already seen recessions. So what is this telling you? This is telling you that you cannot procline, you cannot expand to make room for the teeth. If you start doing a case like this with aligners without actually thinking about that, you're going to end up 
with an anterior open bite. So it is in here where you start saying, okay, I cannot expand because I don't have enough uh, buccal bone. I already have recessions. In I cannot procline those anteriors. They are already proclined. I'm going to open the bite. So what do I have left? Okay, I can do distalization, but I will need distalization of both arches. So that means that I need anchorage. If I was doing only upper distalization, I can use class two elastics, lower distalization, class three elastics. But in here, I need to distalize both arches. So what do I need to do? Mini implants, infrasigmatic mini implants or and buccal shelf mini implants and bring everything towards the back. But this sometimes is going to be a little bit more tricky. Sometimes the uh, mini screws can loosen. So this is a patient that actually I went and I did distractions. So if you don't want to alter too much, uh, well, this is more about how you manage to close these spaces. You can do first or second premolar extraction where you are beginning. Then if you don't want to alter too much the upper and lower lip position, you can do uh, second premolar extractions. If you actually have a patient that is very protrusive, you go and do first premolar. But the important thing here is to make that diagnostics. Don't go ahead and try to uh, just expand a patient that is already showing periodontal problems. Next slide. So in here, something that can help your treatment plan. Uh, in here we have some photographs from the Gregoret uh, book. is very good if you are just starting in orthodontics. So we already know, like in the low, uh, in the left picture, if we have a patient that has a vertical growth tendency, it's a patient that I don't want to maybe expand too much and I want to control that vertical dimension. So it's a patient that actually aligners are going to work very well because aligners are going to help us to control the vertical dimension because posterior teeth are not going to be able to extrude so well because you have in there a material so uh, like the plastic is not going to allow for a very nice extrusion if you don't plan for that. So it's going to help us a lot because we know that with braces the first thing that happens is extrude have a lower third that is increased. And actually also this patient, when we start to think about if we it might be an ideal patient to do extractions also. And this is something very related to towards the extraction, the part of facial aesthetics about how is that lip position. This is going to tell us if we want to modify it or not. If we want to modify it, sometimes we do distalization or extractions. We can use also the vertical line of glabella to see subnasal point and pogonium point. And this is going to determine, okay, if I have a very protruded maxilla or a very protruded mandible or the opposite. It's also going to help me to know if I need distractions or if I need orthognatic surgery or just some dental movements that are very simple. You can also use the subnasal point uh, line. You can also use the uh, subnasal angle. If you already have a very acute subnasal angle in there, you know that if you want to decrease it, it might be beneficial to do extractions. If you have already a very open nasolabial angle, Want to give more support towards that upper lip. So you want to avoid that and because you don't want to end up with a, a straight face like or a straight profile or a dish profile, how some people call it. And then you can also use the vertical line of Andrews. This is uh, the last image that you see in there. This, you can find it on the article of Andrews. And it's going to tell you, okay, the ideal position of the upper incisors. And this is going to also tell you where you want to move it. The good thing is that if you do cephalometrics and you plan for this, if you take your time, your cases are going to be a success because it's not like braces with aligners. We can tell the technician, for example, we already see an IMPA, the lower incisors are at, I don't know, 85 degrees and we want them at 90 degrees. So you just tell the technician, okay, do five degrees of proclination. Or if you want to compensate, because you know that sometimes you are not going to be able to get a whole movement, you tell them, okay, give me 95 degrees, 10 degrees of proclination. So you are adding an extra five degrees, just in case you are not able to fully get those other five degrees. So in here, that is the, amazing thing about the liners. You can actually go to the cephalometrics and improve that angulations to the ideal and compensate that. Next slide. 
Also in here, something that we have in our software is that we are able to see the Bolton discrepancy. And this is very important because nowadays we see a lot of patients that have very small upper laterals and even centrals. So we need to take into consideration when we are doing our treatment plan and later we are going to show a case the Bolton discrepancy, because we want to have an overjet that is going to be around two millimeters. Why? Because that overjet is what is going to give me the dissolution to have a, a temporal mandibular joint health. So in here, sometimes we have mandibular excess, and when we have mandibular excess, we have two options. We can go and do veneers on the upper arch, or we can do stripping on the lower arch. So this is something very important for you to plan before you actually send the case because you want to be very precise with this because this is what you're going to tell the patient since the beginning. You're going to tell the patient, okay, it might be better for us to open the spaces around the upper laterals to place veneers so we can have an adequate overjet or we can do just a stripping because it is just a little discrepancy. Next slide. So in here, uh, we have an example of one of the case that the doctor sent and this is why we are doing this webinar because we want for all of you to be very precise on the instruction that you're giving. So in this case, the doctor said, enlarge the dentition, uh, one, one, two, one, two, one, okay, the lower incisors are tilted to the lip side, align the maxillary midline with the mandible, IPR is 0.4 millimeters or less. So if you see this, okay, enlarge, most of us know that is the same as expansion, but okay, they are, lip side for me actually it's opposite they are towards the uh, thumb or towards the lingual or palatal side and they are telling us align the maxillary midline with the mandible so how do you want to achieve this because you can align the maxillary midline with uh, ipr you can align that maxillary midline uh, with distalization you can do it with distractions so in here it's very important for you to be detailed because sometimes uh, maybe you forgot about taking a frontal photograph of the patient. So also we are not able to help you in that because there is nothing that we can evaluate. So you need to actually tell us how much movement you want and how you want to achieve that movement. So you can actually have a good plan. So Constantine, if you want, you can show the case. And actually this was a case that had a lot of uh, Bolton discrepancy. Do you see those upper incisors? Those upper incisors, they have. So, how was this uh, treatment done? This treatment was done. And if you go, you want, you can go to the initial position, Constantine. This case was done. If you want, you can uh, eliminate the supreme position. Uh, this treatment was done with the lower incisor extraction. That was the only way that we were going to be able to end up with a good overjet. And actually, if you see in here, that is uh, extraction space is actually almost enough to resolve the crowding and actually was not enough. So in here, we want to actually tell the doctor or well, the technicians and also for us to be able to see, okay, how do you want to solve that lack of overjet and that lack of space. So that is very important because this is something that also, once again, is very important with the liners. We need to have space. If we don't have space, we are not going to be able to move the teeth. So it's not just that's it because sometimes we cannot do that expansion. We are limited. So we need to be very descriptive. So if you want, Constantine, you can go to the slide, next slide. So normally, how do you want to make these treatment plans? So this is the first thing, okay, your objectives. This is something you need to plan for yourself. This, you don't need to upload this if you don't want, but this is more for you because when you plan your objectives, you're going to be able to get the final result or you're going to be able actually to create your treatment plan. So for example, here, we had a little bit of a telescopic bite. So we, in the transversal uh, plane, we want to correct the telescopic bite we want to correct the torques of the posterior teeth. If you see the advantage of this case, even though it has a lot of uh, crowding on the upper arch, is that all the posterior teeth are tip uh, lingually or well, palatally. So we can create a lot of space just by making a good torque. What is important to say, and we cannot actually as supervisors go and 
do the over treatment because some doctors they don't understand it and they actually are going to reject the case. So normally we are going to give you like the ideal scenario if you write correctly your treatment plan, but sometimes we want to go beyond what is perfect. So what do I mean? I mean that, okay, I if this was my case, I was going to tell the clinician, okay, do expansion of the posterior teeth, but at the same time you're doing that expansion, I want for you to also be doing palatal crown torque. Why? Because I know that my aligner is going to make this type of expansion. It's going to move the teeth like this. And how the patient takes it off, sometimes they stretch it on the posterior region. So it's actually going to active a little bit of posterior torque, uh, positive torque. So I want to compensate that. So I want when my aligner is doing that expansion to also be doing some palatal crown torque. So this is going to compensate any proclination that I might get. Because if we get proclination of those posterior teeth, a lot of it, the palatal cost is going to come down and is going to create an anterior open bite. We never want to have a palatal cost that are lying uh, behind the occlusal plane or, sorry, uh, below the occlusal plane. So that is very important for you to compensate. So something that like clinical tip, sometimes, well, normally I will always ask posterior expansion with a little bit of palatal crown torque. You can have five, 10 degrees and you can control it there in your treatment. Also in the vertical sense, okay, a treatment plan is a final overbite of three millimeters. That is our objective, but we need to tell the technician how we want to achieve that. On the sagittal plane, class one canine and molar relationship, two millimeters of overjet. And the aesthetics, in this case, in the photograph, the patient had a good the upper incisor position. So we want to maintain it in the same place, vertically and sagittal. So next slide. Transversal correction of the telescopic bite with expansion and proclination, mainly of the lower posterior teeth. We want to coordinate the arches, maximum one millimeter of expansion pier side. Why? Because this is an older patient and it didn't have a lot of bone. Sagittally, we want to do the correction to class one with two millimeters of upper sequential distalization and class two elastics. This is very important. The limit normally of distalization that we are going to do without auxiliary techniques, without auxiliary techniques, I mean about without uh, mini screws is two millimeters. Beyond two millimeters, most of the times, the teeth are not going to track well. Also, we are going to do this distalization sequentially. We want to move first the molar, the second molar, then the first molar, then the second premolar, and so on, because we need anchorage. And that is the great thing about aligners. We are actually able with the aligner to stabilize all the anterior region to serve as anchorage to move the posterior teeth. And we also help that with some elastics. Normally, to do a uh, movement that, or whenever I have a distalization and I have retroclined upper incisors, they are like this. I will place the class two elastics towards a button. I place a button on the canine and I use the elastic like that because if I place a hook on the aligner and I use the uh, elastic towards the hook, my whole aligner is doing this. I'm grabbing with the elastic and I'm pushing everything back. So if I want to procline those upper incisors, it's going to stop a little bit that movement. But if I already have a good inclination of those upper incisors, then it is in those cases that I ask for the hook on the aligner and I grab the whole aligner and move it back. So I get more of a in-group distalization, even though I'm doing it sequentially. Uh, in here, I want to strike the tree one due to the Bolton discrepancy. And in here, I ask for not to change the sagittal position of the upper incisor. And this is just a way, this is not uh, the case. This is with us helping the doctor sometimes. Want to change the upper incisor position with, uh, we were going to do a little bit of IPR. And in the vertical position, we were going to uh, end up with an overbite of three millimeters. We didn't want to extrude or intrude the upper incisors. We want to achieve the final position uh, with extrusion of the lower incisors. And we didn't want to extrude the posterior teeth. Next slide. So in here, once again, this is just another example. The doctor asked for improved upper and lower plexus. When the technician sees this, and also when we are done to see this, we don't understand very well. So in here, it is important to be specific on what do you mean? And the doctor asked for improvement of the upper and lower plexus, move the midline of the maximal uh, of the maxilla to the left to align it with the mandible, maxillary pressure drop. 
the same again. We don't understand very well why is pressure drop, and how do you want to move that midline? This is very important to be very specific. Also in here, uh, well, if you initial position and the final position, you see here that three four is actually tilted towards lingual. So what is important when you have a patient like this? with uh, a premolar that is tilted uh, lingually or that is actually almost without the space, inserts creating the space. I know sometimes we are hurry up and we want to move that tooth since the beginning, but you need to first create the space. So we are going to ask in these cases when you have a tooth like that to first create the space, and then we're going to start moving it. And it's very important with these premolars, the lower ones, that sometimes we are going to incorporate cross elastics. Because if you see a lower premolar, we don't have enough space on the lingual area to actually put an attachment or for the aligner to grab it well. So sometimes it's just going to slip the aligner from that tooth. So we want in there to have surface. If we don't have a lingual wall that is very, with a lot of height, we are not going to be able to put movement. So when we have a case like that, we are going to incorporate auxiliary techniques, cross elastics. So it's very important. With aligners nowadays, we can do almost any type of case but we need to incorporate auxiliary techniques, just as with braces. If you have with a patient that you're going to place braces and you have a 50 degree rotation of a premolar, you're not going to try to put the wire on that slot of that bracket because it's not going to enter. You need to first start, okay, with some couples of forces, buttons and elastics or chain elastics and start derotating. And then you incorporate that tooth towards the braces, well, towards the arch wire. And this is the same. Sometimes we need to first start making movements with auxiliary techniques, and then we incorporate that into the aligners. If you want, you can show now the case, Constantine. So as you can see here, we have a very deep um, overbite in this just to intrude those upper and lower incisors. Also, and this is what I was talking, when we have um, patients with a deep bite and we want to actually solve this deep bite with upper, um, sorry, with posterior extrusion, because we have the aligner in there, the thickness of the aligner, we are not going to be able uh, sometimes to get that posterior extrusion. So actually these bite rams, they are going to work very well. You put the anterior bite rams, so it's going to help you intrude the incisors, but it's also going to liberate the posterior teeth. So now these posterior teeth are liberated from the occlusion and you can extrude it with the aligners. But sometimes I prefer just to go and incorporate some box elastics and also help that extrusion movement. So if you want, you can click play. So in here, you can see that the intrusion is the last thing we are doing of the incisors. Why? We need to have those incisors or that root of those upper incisors and lower incisors to be inside the bone. So when we already have a good inclination, we start to make that intrusion. If we don't have a good inclination of that root inside the bone, then we might be pushing that tooth towards cortical and we are not going to get intrusion and we can get apical root resorption. So this is how we normally plan it. And this is why sometimes you are going to see cases that take a little bit longer because what we are doing is first we are proclining the teeth or we are actually giving the good torque and then we are intruding it. This is a case uh, from the doctor. And this is why I'm telling you sometimes we cannot go and interfere too much because we don't know if these doctors know how to handle well, like, um, and extraction, but if you go to the initial position, uh, Constantine, and you put it from the uh, left side. Okay, if you see in here, we have a class two molar relationship, a class two molar relationship to be able to solve it. With distalization and class two elastic, this molar relationship, a kind of relationship is not going to be solved. So it is in these cases where we need to think, okay, I cannot tell the technician, just give me a class one. How you are going to achieve this class one with the liners? Okay, distalization, this is around six millimeters. You are not going to be able to do it with just class two elastics. You need something else. You need mini screws. Okay, that is something you can do. You don't know how to use mini screws. 
the easiest way of how to do this is first premolar extraction, retract the upper incisors, and that's it. But this also depends on how is the profile of the patient. Sometimes this is a type of patient that if I'm really already seeing that the patient has a retrognatic mandible, this is a patient that is going to benefit from a mandibular advancement. So this is also something that I need to consider. I don't like sometimes to camouflage patients that are skeletal. But some, obviously, if I go and I tell the patient and I explain, okay, then that is okay. But I need to always tell them because the stability. So if I see that they have the upper lip that is really protruded, easy. First premolar extraction, some elastics from the canine towards the first molar because I, or towards the second molar, however you like. And I just start retracting with the help of those elastics. I ask for button cutouts on the canine and on the first molar, buccal and lingual. So I have two forces, one buccal and one lingual, and I'm closing that space. But this is something that we need to request. We are not going to tell you do an extraction because we are not seeing the patient. If you want, you can go to the next slide. Constantine. So once again, we plan our objectives. This is how I would have requested if this was my patient that will have asked for a class two molar relationship at the end and a class one canine relationship at the end. Next slide. And I will, so for example, extraction of the one four and two four, closure of the space reciprocal on the right side. On the left side is with maximum anchorage and I would achieve the class Two molar relationship. I don't care to have a class two molar relationship. What I care is a class one canine relationship. I request in here a button cutout uh, on that one six, one three, two three, and two six on the buccal and palatal side. As I mentioned, I go and I place the buttons and I put a chain elastic in there. So the patient is using the chain elastic in there, already have it. And well, we are closing that space with the help of the aligner. The aligner is actually helping us just to maintain the position, the torque, and all well, the rotations to avoid any rotations. If I want to close the space a little bit faster, normally what I do is that I don't use chain elastic. I give the patient a one eighth of an inch elastic around uh, 3.5 ounces you can use, or even two ounces is going to work. And just tell the patient, okay, the elastic, a regular elastic, one eighth of an inch. And that is going to sometimes be better because the patient is going to change it once a day and that force is going to be, well, better. You, we know that chain elastics are going to lose their force even in one day, depending on the brand that you're using, towards seven days. So with those regular elastics, we are actually maintaining the force every single day. So we're going to get a better closure of that space. But we are going to send this only if we see that the patient is very compliant. If we see that it's a, especially a male patient around 14, 15 years old, we know uh, boys are not going to listen to us. So we can just go and put chain elastics. Next slide. And this is just to finish. And uh, the same instruction of the doctor was align the lower jaw with the midline of the upper jaw, lip, lipally tilt the mandibular anterior teeth. And this is the same. We don't understand this. Okay, so we are uh, going out of time. So if you want, Constantine, you just can go to the next slide. Oh, well, yeah, let's show the case in here. And this is very important. You need attachments because sometimes doctors, we create a treatment plan. They say, take off the attachments. The attachment is what is going to control us. The torque we is going to control us the inclination. Without the attachments, we cannot control the root position. The attachment is going to work like this slot on the bracket. That attachment is giving me two surfaces where I can actually create a couple and create those moment to force ratios to get the root movement. If I don't have attachments in there, I'm going to have trouble uh, just overriding the roots. So in here, it's very important for you to know if your patient tells you, okay, I don't want attachments on my case, you're only going to tilt the teeth. You are going to angle it. It's very important. As you can see here, those upper incisors, they were tilted or well, they were angulated distally. If we want to bring that root with also the movement of the 
crown, we need to have attachments in there. If we don't have attachment, normally what is going to happen is that we might have a refinement or we just tilt the crowns, but the root is going to stay in the same position. We are just going, to, if we have this tooth, the root will stay here and the tooth will just do this. If we want to actually move the tooth and uh, well, the crown and the root, we need those attachments in there. We need a place where we can create those couple and forces. So once again, it's just the treatment objectives. This is for ourselves. If you want, you can incorporate them. But then you go and next slide, you create the treatment plan. You, for me, it's easier if you write it like this. And also I think for the technicians, because you're separating everything and you have it in there as a proof. Uh, misaligned. In here, if you have it like this, in bullet points, vertically, it's very difficult for the technician and for the supervisor to miss something because everything is divided, everything is written re really well. So we can just go and see transversal, what do you want to achieve? Vertical, what do you want to achieve? And sagittally, what do you want to achieve?